Hi, welcome to the Libro FM podcast, the monthly series where we talk to authors, narrators, booksellers, and more. I'm Karen. And I'm Craig. On today's episode, we spoke with Danny Kane, who is the owner of the Raven Bookstore in Lawrence, Kansas, and is also a poet and author of How to Resist Amazon and Why, and the forthcoming How to Protect Bookstores and Why, which comes out tomorrow at the time of recording on September 19th. Danny has been a longtime friend and supporter of Libro FM. Um, I think the first time I came across his name actually was in his book, How to Resist Amazon and Why. I was flipping through it, saw mentions to Libro FM. Um, and so it's really cool now to have met him, not just on the podcast, but um, to meet him in person at the Children's Institute in Milwaukee. I just couldn't resist. I'm like, Danny, you're the perfect guest for the podcast. You have to. You, have you just to join couldn't us. resist, and why? <laughs> <laughs> no, Danny is amazing. Um, meeting him in person was awesome. I think that's how this podcast episode was kind of born. We were like, hey, Danny, nice to meet you. What you doing soon? Do you want to be on our <laughs> podcast? Um, and he was very gracious um, to say yes and with his time. And I really enjoyed this interview. Yeah. And something really exciting. I don't know. I don't think this is mentioned in the episode, but um, for the audio book of his new book, How to Protect Bookstores and Why, this podcast interview is actually going to be included at the end. So very cool little crossover that we've done here. (laughs) Very nerve wracking, I think is what you meant to say. That too. It will live on forever. (laughs) I'm losing sleep over it. Yes. Um, So without further ado, should we let the podcast roll. And um, as always, we will be here at the end of the episode to banter about books, tease future episodes, etc. Perfect. Let's do it. Welcome to the podcast, Danny. It's great to see you again. Likewise. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Yeah, we've been talking about this for a while now. Um, we all got to hang out in Milwaukee at Children's Institute. And I, I think I mentioned to you, Danny, when we start the podcast, we always say it's for authors, narr- narrators, booksellers, and more. And I was like, you're all of them. <laughs> so you are our perfect <laughs> guest. We must guess, have you on this. <laughs> although I've only done the narrator thing once. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, I guess that's true. We're going to kill two ravens with one stone. <laughs> Thanks. So I'll, I'll edit that so out I've, promptly. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, so I, I kind of spoiled it with a, a brief introduction to what you do. But um, for our listeners, um, can you give us an intro to yourself and kind of all the things you're up to in the, the bookish world? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, well, my name is Danny Kane. I am, I, I suppose my main day job is a part owner of the Raven Bookstore uh, in Lawrence, Kansas, where I work on scheduling and ordering. I'm on the ordering team on, on the events team, and I do all of the bill paying um, and HR stuff. I'm also an author, a uh, poet. I've put out four poetry collections and a book called How to Resist Amazon and Why, which is a nonfiction book. And its follow-up is coming imminently. It's called How to Protect Bookstores and Why. It's out this fall. Both of those are from Microcosm Publishing. And yeah, I mean, Libro helped me put together an audiobook of how to resist Amazon and why, which I recorded um, in a very interesting studio that was essentially a barn. It was really, it was a fun story, but it was like someone who knew someone from Kansas Public Radio. Um, he was like, oh yeah, you know, Mike has a studio. You can go out there. And it was like in the middle of, of nowhere in Kansas, in the middle of the country. <laughs> it was like this, this cinder block building that housed a giant like guitar and miscellany collection. And I was sitting on a beat up couch with like his, his barn cats crawling all over me. <laughs> uh, just wow. my book. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. <laughs> um, like the studio didn't have a bathroom in it. So it's like I was drinking a lot of water. And every time I took it, because I'm not used to talking for four hours straight or whatever. And every time I had to take it, it's just like, oh, just go out back. <laughs> <There's no one laughs> out. <laughs> I'm sure that's what all audiobook studios look like. He was great. I'm saying this not to complain because it was it was a hugely memorable experience and he was a great host. But it was it was definitely an adventurous day or two when I recorded that book. Yeah, peeing peeing in the backyard is important to the audiobook process, I hear, you know. So <laughs> pretty standard. Pretty standard. Yeah. <laughs> that's what the last narrator said too, for sure. <laughs> yeah, boy, we're four minutes into this podcast and we've already gone some places, huh? That was yeah. Just my intro. Oh, just just you wait, Danny. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we have tons of questions for you. We're definitely going to want to hear more about this audiobook experience. Um, but to kick us off, um, we wanted to talk a little bit more about Raven Bookstore, um, mm-hmm. which I know is in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, you're a part owner there. It's entirely employee owned. Um, 
I loved reading about this bookstore online. Um, your mission statement is really beautiful. So in your own words, we would love for you to just talk a little bit more about um, what The Raven is, what makes it so special, why you love it so much. Sure. Uh, the Raven was founded in Lawrence in 1987. So it's it's a pretty long time for a bookstore. Um, and since the beginning, it's been really community oriented. I think any bookstore that's that's going to succeed has to be really plugged into its community. In the 80s, when it started, that meant specializing in mystery and local titles, because there were a lot of bookstores in Lawrence, and they all had their own specialties. But since then, as the other bookstores have closed, we've become kind of the the general audience bookstore for new books in, in Lawrence. Um, and part of that was moving to a new location on a little bit busier part of the street where we're on. Um, part of that, and, and in terms of employee ownership, part of that is just trying to make sure we're providing good jobs in both in Lawrence and in the book selling community where it's really, especially in the book selling community, it's really a challenge to build a career or to, to make a living wage. And we try a lot of different things to do that. Um, one of which is employee ownership. So the, the, the kind of our core leadership team all have ownership stakes in, in the business and they, they share decision-making um, and, and strategic planning with me. Um, part of it is we just have a pretty high starting wage as high as we possibly can. Um, and, you know, there are countless ways that a bookstore would plug into its community, but that's kind of where we start is what can we do for the community and how can our role as a bookstore help make, Lawrence and America and the book industry a better place, which sounds really lofty when I say that, but it really does animate us because um, I do think a bookstore is kind of uniquely suited uh, to be a force for good um, in the world. Perhaps I don't, I don't want to say more so than other small businesses, but just in terms of bookstores, I think there are a lot of things a bookstore can do to, to fight for positive change. That was the line from your mission statement that I loved. I think it's like the first one where it says, we believe that is like bookstores and books may not be able to solve all the world's problems, but they're a great place to yeah. start. Um, and you talked a little bit at the beginning about all of the different hats that you wear at the bookstore. Um, what does your day to day look like? And has that changed over time or, you know, what, what is your life there? I mean, been? <laughs> one of the, one of the things I love about working at a bookstore is that there, the days don't really look the same, which is, I mean, that's nice for me. I don't really do that great in a, like a daily routine. Um, but I, I mean, given I, my weeks do have a rhythm, like early in the week, I'm really focusing on restock and, and kind of rebuilding the inventory after weekend sales. Um, payroll happens twice a month. Schedule making happens every two weeks. And then aside from those daily things, I'm always meeting with sales reps because I do front list ordering for adults. And so I'll have um, I'll be looking at Edelweiss catalogs and talking to sales reps and putting together our orders for the next um, the next season. Um, yesterday, I had a meeting with our events team in the public library because um, we're teaming up with them on a couple events this fall. Nice. And so it's a lot of stuff. Um, and then, you know, I always have to try to save time to write too. And I generally mm. do that more in the afternoons. And it's like, I'll kind of blast through Raven stuff in the morning and then find a coffee shop somewhere to go work on whatever writing project I've got cooking up. And then five o'clock, it's time to pick up from daycare. And it's like, <laughs> it's like dad is another, is another hat. Um, you know, it's perhaps bigger than all of those other things, but it's, I like being busy. I like, uh, it helps me stay interested and motivated. My last question I want to ask you about Raven is entirely selfish. I love zines. I love reading mm -hmm. them. I love making them. And um, I see that there is a big zine presence on yeah. the website for Raven. Um, how did that come to be? And, and what does this look like? <laughs> sure. It was like, it was, I mean, really early on in this like whole Amazon pro small business journey that we're on, I had some tweets from the Raven account get really popular and a friend of mine who runs a bookstore in Cleveland called Max Backs, a really good friend, um, texted me and said, you know, those tweets that are going viral, you should turn them into a broadside or a zine. And I'm like, oh, that's a really good idea. Because um, it was just like in that particular conversation about bookstores and Amazon, it felt like a really good resource to help broaden that conversation and to give stores to have that conversation with their customers. Because like booksellers are really good at having that conversation among themselves. But like... I was happy to try to make a resource to, to make that, to facilitate that conversation happening with customers. When I was in grad school, I had started making zines. Um, we had a pretty cool, I was teaching English 101 and 102 
And the person who ran the comp program at KU at the time was like an, uh, a zinester. He was, you know, in the nineties, he, he was in the scene. Um, and so as like one of the writing projects for English 101 at KU for a couple of years was to, to write a zine and talk about audience and rhetoric and, and stylistic choices and how to communicate. So it was like, as I was prepping those lessons, I learned how to make zines myself. And whenever I would read at a poetry open mic or something, I would just make a zine of, of t- my 10 most recent poems and, and sell a little pile at the book table. Cause it's like my poetry, my first poetry book took seven years to write. I was well out of grad school by the time it got published. And it's fun to like, I don't like when you're out reading to be able to buy dinner or something. And plus just to have something to make and design, it was really fun. So long story short, I had the zine making skills kind of in my back pocket when my friend told me you should make your tweets into a zine. And so I did, it came together really quickly. And then that just exploded. Um, and, and made a lot of things possible, one of which is we've got kind of an unofficial Raven zine series where every once in a while when I'll have time, I'll put together some kind of um, a, a zine for the store. One of them was about the post office when they were threatening to shut that down um, when they were in big trouble a couple summers ago. Another one, um, I don't even remember how it started. I think a customer during the pandemic when we were shut down, they just randomly sent us a recipe in the comments of their online order. Uh, and it was like, thank you so much, Raven. We miss you. Here's a great chocolate chip cookie recipe. <laughs> and I loved that so much. I was really tickled. And it was a time where we were really lonely. It was just, you know, five or six of us in the store processing online orders. And so, and I was also looking for fun stuff to put on social media because that was the only way we could keep in touch. And then I was just like, oh my God, look at this. This is hilarious. Everybody, this person sent us a recipe in the order comments and I put it on Twitter. And then of course, everybody started sending us recipes, <laughs> um, which is the best. And then we had like 40 or 50 of them. And so we just made a cookbook. That was one of our <laughs> Raven zines is we turned all the recipes from the comments into a little cookbook. And so, yeah, um, it's been a while since I've made a zine, but we do have maybe five or six in-house zines that we've made um throughout my time there and it's just a fun project oh the best one though my favorite is um one of our cats fell asleep on the keyboard during the winter time it's really cold <laughs> and so they fell asleep on on one of the cash registers and one of my coworkers had the brilliant presence of mind to open up a word document while he was asleep <laughs> on the keyboard and it just filled up with text and this is me thinking as like a former english grad student but i was like this is a really interesting like postmodern metatextual experiment <laughs> yep. and so he it, like it was 50 pages long before he got up and so we published it as a novel just this chunk <laughs> of illegible text and and I put together like a really um, like high minded introduction talking about the, the animal authored text and the post human and all this stuff. It was hilarious. And we also did an author event with him. And I had little like I was sitting there on Crowdcast. I had little pieces of turkey that I was feeding him to keep him on camera. And I was feeding him all these really pretentious questions. That was oh a lot God. of fun. <laughs> that was great. We did get one order, though, like someone ordered 10 and then returned it and was like, this is not what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> like, I was promised a novel by a cat. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what you got. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so yeah, this is, it's just fun. It's one of the ways that the bookstore can kind of show its voice and its personality. I love it. Do you have a photocopier in the bookstore? Where are you photocopying these? No, we printed them. I, for a <laughs> while, it's, it's, I know, it feels a little anti-punk to do that. For, <laughs> for a long time, when the Amazon zine came out, I was like, I have to photocopy these and staple these myself. So that's authentic. And then, like, word got out, and I was just going through hundreds and hundreds of orders. And it was like, I need my social life back. I'm spending every night, <laughs> yeah. every afternoon at Kinko's and every night at the dining room table with my long arm staple. And yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> can't can't staple anymore. Right. <laughs> well, speaking of the Amazon zine, that is our next question. Um, but before we get to that, I want to know, did you make those cookies and were they delicious? Oh yeah. I think um I'm not the baker on staff, but I'm I'm pretty sure we have made <laughs> some of this stuff from the, the recipe. Nice. There's some really interesting things in there. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. So how to resist Amazon and why, um, before we jump into the questions about this, first off, just want to say thank you for partnering with Libro Mm -hmm. over the past forever, for a while, but especially over the past week, um, for listeners who, um, may not know, we made the audiobook version of how to resist Amazon and why free for all listeners, um, during the prime day event. So thanks for doing that with us. That was awesome. 
It's, it was your idea. I really, I loved it. <laughs> it was a lot of fun and it was really amazing uh, just to get tagged in, in so many social media posts as people were talking about this and, yeah. and making their arguments about supporting small businesses. It was, it was a dream come true. So it was really cool. Awesome. For us too, for sure. So you kind of started talking about this a little bit, but um, for people that may not know or have not read this, can you just tell us what this is and kind of how you got started with it? Yeah, well, I mean, the story, that's the story of the tweets turning into the zine. And then um, we kind of left off with me overwhelmed with the stapler. (laughs) And then um, I got a message from Microcosm Publishing, from Joe, who runs Microcosm, um, just asking, and like I had already known Microcosm, they stopped selling directly to Amazon. They're one of the very few publishers, if not the only, I mean, the the only publisher their size, certainly who has taken a stand. And they're like, we don't sell directly to Amazon. Amazon has to buy their stuff third party through a wholesaler or something. And they, they made a big deal about this. And I think wrote some really interesting things about the relationship between um, Amazon and publishers. And so I already knew this in the back of my brain and they reached out and they were like, this zine is really cool we want to put out a version of it too. And that came right as I was exhausted by putting together my own. Uh, and I was like, this is great timing. I would love your help. You guys, my arm is sore. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Um, and then, I mean, within a couple months, it was selling well enough that he came back and was like, I think this needs to turn into a book. Um, I think there's more work to do. And we, we went back and forth about what form it would take the book I had in mind, um, to write was actually how to protect bookstores and why the one that just came out, that was the kind of book I was dreaming of. Um, but he was like, no, I think we need to write about Amazon first. And we, we, you know, this editor author kind of discussions. Um, but we, we agreed on a format and expanded it into a book and it just, it went, it took off. And it's, I think it's fulfilling that role in a lot of places where, where people are concerned, people are handing it to people to have that discussion about, um, corporate monopolies and small businesses and the importance of our communities. Um, so, and then, yeah, then that it started selling and then I got the chance. I was like, well, I, I have this idea for a sequel I've been sitting on for a really long time. And that's how it turned into the new one. Not a, not a conventional path for a nonfiction book. That's not usually <laughs> how it works. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Via Twitter DM. <laughs> I've only read the original like orange kind of like uh-huh. more zine like one, um, but I have seen photos and I've seen them in the store too of the second edition with the kind of illustrated yeah. cover for mm-hmm. folks like me who have only read the first one. What should like, why should I go run to my bookstore and grab the second one? What should I expect it to be different? You know, the, this, it took just as long to expand it into a second edition that it did to write the whole first one. So it's all, I think of it as an entirely different book. Um, one thing I added was a new chapter on the climate. I didn't get, I didn't really, um, I didn't get to address climate change in the way I wanted to in the first book. So I added a new chapter on that. I expanded a lot, but just the discussion of books. And like, I think there's a book argument against Amazon is that it's like, if you like books, that's not a good place to buy books. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't, they don't, they sell books like they don't care about books. Um, and, and for someone like me who really loves books, there are more fun and more joyful ways and just more literary ways to, to purchase. And so I really looked at the, the, the decline in quality of the book experience on Amazon a lot in the second edition. And then it's like, I mean, after I turned it in, a lot happened. Like a lot of important stuff happened that I was like, I think I need to revisit this, primarily being on the labor side. You had um, massive union drives in Bessemer, Alabama and Staten Island, New York. And the Staten Island one is successful in forming a a labor union at an Amazon facility, which a lot of people thought was never going to happen. And I had just the very, very beginning of that story in the first edition um, because Christian Smalls, who ended up starting the the labor union in Staten Island, was fired over organizing a a COVID protest um, to in in favor of bringing safety measures to his Amazon warehouse. And they, they made a point of scapegoating him. And that's where that story ended in, in the first edition. But then he like went on to organize and create this national movement um, of, of Amazon labor. And that felt really important to me uh, to include in the second edition. The, they've joked about a third edition. I don't know if I even want to do that <laughs> or not, but it's like stuff keeps happening. And I mean, yeah. people are saying... Um, that Lena Khan and the FTC are gearing up to do a really big antitrust lawsuit against Amazon sometime this summer. And like, that's pretty huge. 
Yeah. Um, and it addresses a lot of the challenges I talk about in the book, um, presumably. So we'll see. Um, one of the challenges of writing current events nonfiction I've found is figuring out when to stop. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's like you current events keep in. happening. Right, right. Um, well, you, you've sold me. I will go buy the second edition okay. at, my, at my local <laughs> bookstore right after this. Well, and I wanted to talk about the audiobook a little bit. Thank mm-hmm. you for setting the visual for us at the beginning of <laughs> a barn in the middle of nowhere. B- barn Boy, cats. did you. <laughs> I want to, we need to see pictures of this. Um, I wanted to ask you just in general, you know, what your experience was with being a narrator was like uh-huh. um, a lot of folks that we've talked to who are narrating their own books have told us they're not a huge fan of doing it's it. It's really like, intense. I hate it. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, you're definitely coming face to face with the, um, in the book. And it's like, I mean, there's like another thing you learn after you publish a book is it's like, it's impossible to publish a book without any mistakes in it. Um, and I had thought I found all the mistakes, but then I did the audio book and there were a couple things. It was like, then they're fixed. Another reason to buy the second edition is because I fixed all the stuff I noticed when I was doing the audio book. Cause it's like you read through it over and over again when you're in the editing process, but reading it out loud is paying a whole different kind of attention. Um, and it was like, it was physical. It was rigorous. I mean, and my book is short. It's, I think it's just like a four hour audio book or maybe even three and a half, but it took two days and it was, um, it, it's definitely, uh, a physical experience to, to do that much. I can't imagine the folks who are doing this for eight hours every day. They probably um, don't have barn cats crawling all over them in the booth true. though, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. But it, you gave me a newfound respect for the people who are really good. Um, yeah. And I, like, I listen to Libro all the time and it's, it's amazing what a good narrator can do to really animate a book. And there, I mean, there have been some books that I thought were more fun to read on audio than on the page, just because the, the narrator brings so much, um, so much more to the text. Do you have any favorite narrators? That you like? I was. I knew revisit. you were going to ask that. Um, I have to. I'm pulling up my app because I want to <laughs> shout them out. Um, so I'm opening my library. I just read the. Um, oh, I guess that was author. Um, the Net and Yahoo's by Joshua Cohen, which won the Pulitzer mm. a couple years ago. I guess he's the narrator on that. He did a great job. Um, and that that one has like music and a couple other voices too. So that's a really awesome. good audiobook production. Um, I love that book so much, though, that I had to get to the end. And so I was like alternating between a paper copy and the the Libro. I really <laughs> love the woman who did all of the um, of the Neapolitan novels for Elena Ferrante. Oh, yes. Um, the one the person I love um, who's I also really have a, a really big soft spot for Irish audiobook narrators um that's that's the there's something about a a good irish audiobook narrator that um i'll just listen to anything and so (laughs) all the folks um who have done tana french's um murder squad mysteries that was my candy at the the beginning of the (laughs) pandemic when i couldn't pay attention to anything else i like tore my way through that series um and the best one is the likeness which i listened to and heather o'neill was the narrator on that one of the things i love about libro is that you can click on the narrator's name though like that's super yeah. cool and, and browse um so yeah let me get the elena ferrante hillary yeah. huber that's who it is yeah she's really good awesome thanks so moving on to 50 ways to protect bookstores uh-huh. um so when you said this comes out in the fall yeah, so the 50 Ways to Protect Bookstores is a zine that we put out as kind of a sneak preview. And then the full book version, which is called um, How to Protect Bookstores and Why, I just went to the Microcosm Warehouse this week to get my contributor copies. Um, <laughs> nice. So, yeah, there it is. Um, yeah, what do you want to know? Yeah, <laughs> um, I was just wondering if you could tell us a bit about it and then... Obviously, you cannot tell us all 50 ways because you have zines to sell. But if you uh-huh. want to tell us one or two ways that you think our listeners could, you know, actions they could take to help their bookstores, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, well, the, the the whole project in general, I wanted to tell the same story. Like, this project has always been about the importance of community and small businesses and bookstores in particular in building that community and, and kind of the threats uh, posed to those communities by this billionaire monopoly vision of the world. And I think Amazon, How to Resist Amazon and Why tells that story from a cautionary tale 
but I wanted to really focus on the people who are doing great work in spite of these challenges and in the midst of these challenges. And so How to Protect Bookstores and Why is centered on 12 case studies of, of innovative and inspiring bookstores. Um, I went to all of them. I interviewed uh, multiple people at each place and kind of told their story of, of kind of post-COVID, post-George Floyd, uh, post-inflation book selling, post-gentrification book selling, and like how do you carve out a place and nurture your community in the midst of all this? And then intertwined with all that are these, these kind of practical things for people to show up. I wanted it to be an action-oriented book too, so people could read it and be like, this is how I can help um, bookstores. I think one one thing I heard over and over again is just to show up and, and be part of that community, and like go to events. Of course, buying books is, is kind of the heart of it, but even just being there, making friends with the people who work there, becoming a familiar face, just to have a full bookstore is really important for these places, especially if there's something like an event going on. But showing up could be more um, at times. One thing I kept running into is this kind of assault on the freedom to read uh, that's happening, which is primarily focused on libraries, but it does leak over into bookstores. And one of the bookstores I talked to, Loyalty in Washington, D.C., has had multiple drag story hour events attacked um, by by right-wing protesters, one of which was an actual group of Proud Boys that tried to physically force their way into the store. And, And what saved the event and protected those booksellers in both cases was people showing up. And there was a, like a barricade of allies in the front of the store that was literally forcing the Proud Boys away. Um, it turned into a physical confrontation. But like, I mean, imagine what would have happened if they had made it into the store. And so there are whatever ways to show up for your bookstore or for your community that are called for in that moment are really important. And that's why being plugged into that community is is so crucial because if you're plugged in and and you're communicating with the bookstore and and you're connected, you'll know which which ways they need you to show up. I'm thinking of also um, the great bookstore You and Me in Chinatown in New York City um, was just destroyed in a, a fire. The apartment above it burned down and all the, the, the water flooded down into the bookstore. They're going to be closed for like more than a year, I think. But they raised $300,000 on Kickstarter in like less than a week. And that's another way to show up. If you can, like sometimes the, the solution to the problem is money. And if you have it and the bookstore doesn't, that's another great way to show up. Um, so just being there and present in the community is kind of what animates all 50 of, of the steps in the zine and all that stuff in the, in the book version too. I was just going to ask you a dumb audiobook question next, uh-huh. but I'm going to pivot because okay. <laughs> following on to everything you just told us, which is beautiful, flipping that in the opposite direction, what advice do you have for bookstore owners and booksellers that are struggling with the climate that we're in right now, or even people who think they might want to mm-hmm. enter into this world and are considering opening a store right now? I think it's the the same advice, like connect to a community is really good advice for all involved. And if you're trying to do this alone, it's not going to work. And the reason I think the reason the Raven works um, isn't because like I'm some sort of whiz kid in book selling. It's because we have a really great team and we communicate and everybody brings their strengths. Um, It's a monstrously difficult thing, but the combination of everybody's strengths and working together makes what we do possible. And you can even zoom out again. And like our connection to other bookstores and other people in the industry is also really important. I pull huge inspiration uh, from from my friends and colleagues at at other bookstores In, in America and now around the world. And like that's part of the fun with this book is that it's really connected me to people everywhere. I mean, I went to Paris to interview Shakespeare and company for how to protect bookstores and why they're one of the stores in the book. Um, and, and they were really interested in the Amazon discussion because they're not as far along as we are. And I find that in other countries, people are like, how do we prevent it from getting it as bad as it is there? Um, so, I mean, it's just never act like you're alone in it. Um, and I think, There's a danger to the thinking of like independent bookstores. If you get too independent, that turns into a loan. And that's not true at all. I think it's important to think collectively as well, because we're all facing a lot of the same challenges. Everybody's rent is too high. Um, Everybody's customers are spending less because of inflation. Everybody is facing increased prices of books and paper. Um, 
and and if we team up and communicate and hold space for each other and form communities, I think we're able to address those challenges a lot better. So, and I guess now I will ask my audiobook question. Do sure. you plan to make an audiobook for this one as well? I would love to. I I haven't. Um, I was just it's kind of on my list to see if I can reach out to make it happen, but. Awesome. Um, I would really love to. And I, um, like, I was also thinking about it in editing this time. I was like, let's really be careful <laughs> in the editing and copy <laughs> editing. And shout out to my editor, Olivia at Microcosm. She did a great job uh, keeping me on track and cleaning everything up. Awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. I can't wait to read this. We've obviously been talking about community a whole ton during this entire podcast so far, but we do have one kind of specific question about it. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. And you kind of touched on it a little bit earlier that bookstores are very in their community, maybe even more so than some other small businesses, mm-hmm. although all small businesses are a part of their community in some ways. Um, and I saw just from like e-stalking Raven's <laughs> socials that you are super involved. I saw like signage about like local laws that were, mm-hmm. you know, maybe being passed, food drives, you know, trans rights, readathons, all sorts of stuff in the community. What do you think makes bookstores like yours so uniquely positioned to be so involved in their community? Well, I think it, it, like at its basis, I think book selling is already political, which makes it um, well suited for political and justice work. Because the, the simple question of what you order and what you put on the shelves and how you display it, that itself is arguing for something. Um, like every time you put a book on your shelf, you are arguing something about that book. In a curated bookstore, you're saying like, this book is worthy of your attention. And like that itself is an argument. So if you think of this, this idea comes from um, the feminist bookstores movement in the 1970s. It's called the feminist shelf, but it's the idea that, and they were using it for to further feminist movement goals and practices. But you can also, I think, use it for any kind of, of justice work. The idea that um, creating a certain collection of books and arranging it in a certain way both like what is in what isn't in the store, but where things are situated in relation to each other, you're creating an argument like that's that's a political argument. And so it's not that much of a stretch to push that even further and be like, OK, how are we um, fighting for justice in the greater world? Um, and if people are coming here, we it, like lately, especially um, Kansas just passed this this bill called SB 180. Um, which is a really restrictive attack on trans rights. Um, to, it's ar- arguing about, I mean, the Secretary of State is wants people's um, genders to revert to their sex assigned at birth when they renew their registrations, regardless of, of their gender identity. Um, it has uh, limitations on who can use what kind of bathrooms. It's a really scary bill. And so we find it very important just to create a safe space where queer people can be. And it's like, nobody cares what bathroom you use here. Um, it's it's all gender, it's a single stall, you're safe here. And you're also gonna be, um, we're gonna give you access to reading material that validates who you are and, and gives you strategies to fight for a better world. And so you can see how creating the arguments on yourself turns into real life justice work. And so we just think about our priorities as people and our priorities as booksellers and think about how we can create um, these, how we can use the bookstore model to fight for a better world. I think a great example, we did kind of a a Pride Month closing um, queer mixer. And so we were like, we're going to close the store early and then open it for this kind of private um, event where just queer people, whatever that means to you, can come here and be safe and be amongst each other. And we're creating space for that. And we, we of course, ordered special books that would be of interest um, to folks like that. And we also um, had resources. We had the public library there with resources about changing your birth certificate to better reflect your gender identity. We had people from the Sexual Trauma and Care Center. And so it's like creating a space and also trying to connect people um, with with resources they may need. Um, And I mean, it was great. It was a full store. It was a really great event. Um, And I mean, we're probably going to repeat it. Um, So it's just that kind of work. It's like, what are you already doing as a bookstore and how can you extend it just a little bit to to create uh, some sort of fighting for a better world? God, I love that. Um, your community is lucky to have you, and I feel like we're all lucky to have our bookstores in our our neighborhood. So, thank you for doing that. 
Well, and that's the thing is it's different. It's different per community. And like yeah. a Brooklyn bookstore is going to do something um, that's uniquely special to Brooklyn that Brooklyn might need. And that's where the, I think that's where the idea of independence does uh, become a productive idea is like that every bookstore is going to have a different answer to that question. And that's yeah. important yeah. because every bookstore is in a different community. And that's why national chain, it's like you're not going to get the same thing from um, franchises or, or chains because they're not, they're thinking from a, a national level where a lot of this community stuff is based on really small or local, not small, localized issues um, and, and localized concerns. I feel like every time, right before we get to the lightning round, we have whatever the like hardest conversation the question is. Question. <laughs> and then we have this awkward like, now let's talk about your favorite food. Um, so that was my awkward that. transition into the lightning round. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, like we mentioned before we started recording um, every episode, we like to ask some kind of more silly and potentially more personal questions um, towards the end of the episode. So without further ado, Karen, do you want to ask the first question? I do. I'm so excited. So on your website, your personal website, your header is slightly different on each page, um, revealing that you are a bookseller, a bookstore owner, a poet, and something else. Um, on one of these pages, it says you are an excellent grocery, sh- an excellent <laughs> grocery shopper. Um, what does that look like? And do you have any pro tips? <laughs> was, oh man, that was the first time I've ever been asked about that. I made that website like 15 years ago. Uh, thank you. Um, I think it's also like that's changed um, since having a child. Uh, everything is a lot more overwhelming in terms of the domestic sphere now. <laughs> and so I'm not as proud of my grocery shopping ability as I used to be. I do love grocery stores. Um, and like, I think um, I'm like, I'm happily married and I have been for 10 years. But like, if I like, I think uh, going to a grocery store on a date is a really great idea um, because like, I think you can really learn a lot about somebody. And also like if someone can't make an adventure out of a grocery store, I'm not sure I'd want to be with them. Anyway. <laughs> but like also like going abroad, I love going to grocery stores in other countries. Yes. It, it's mm-hmm. so fun. And I always end up with weird snacks. And um, so it's, I mean, part of me is this is, this is a long answer. This isn't lightning at all. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> this is a lightning storm. You I, know? The, um, <laughs> every writer, you know, just has a couple obsessions. And I like, I write poetry and I write these books about small businesses and communities. And I think they're all kind of animated by the same question of like, how, how do you be human in the post-capitalist world? Um, like, uh, when when corporations control so many aspects of what we experience, how do you find joy and authenticity and, and love and all that other stuff? And and so poetry is one way to explore that, and um, and the, the nonfiction is another. But I think poetry is is great because it's a space for like ambivalence or conflicted feelings much more than um, than nonfiction is, at least how I write it. So like with poems, I can. But like I can critique the conditions that led to a mega supermarket and also find joy in the experience and the the overwhelming bounty that I find there. (laughs) And so that's a lot of what I'm thinking about when I when I write poems. And I think that's probably why something about grocery stores ended up on the website. (laughs) That is an amazing answer. I'm so glad I asked that question. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the how to resist Whole Foods and Why book now. (laughs) Um, Yeah. It's owned by Amazon. Yeah. So it's in there. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I got to get that second edition, you know. <laughs> so what game show do you think you could go on and win? We've been watching a lot of Jeopardy. Um, I um, I like Jeopardy. I like to fantasize about being on Jeopardy. I don't know if it's – that's the answer I want to say. <laughs> but I think the actual true answer is The Price is Right. Nice. And oh, it ties it ties back to the grocery shopper. Like if you need me to put <laughs> six groceries in order of price, I can probably do it better <laughs> than I can have a grasp of the the history of the kings of England or whatever else. Yeah. In literature, literature and poetry categories, I'm always great. Like I'm always rooting for Final Jeopardy to be a book question. Um, yeah. yep. But uh, and it's like there are so many situations where I'm yelling at the screen, like it's Tony Morrison, you idiots! How do you not know this? <laughs> 
So I saw that Raven Bookstore has two bookstore cats. Is that uh-huh. correct? Um, Wait- one is retired and one still lives at the store, but yes. Okay. Well, for the sake of this question, we'll consider them both still okay. active. Um, which which one is your favorite and why? Oh, that's, I can't answer that. I'm going to get in trouble <laughs> if I answer that. Um, so I'm going to... I'll, I'm gonna I'll let it out. There. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> They're both so wonderful. Um, yeah, uh, they were... I mean, Dashiell is the one at the store. He's really gregarious um, and like the classic kind of large male bossy cat. And then Naya was a very regal. Um, she was a tiny black cat. Um, she just kind of got worn out on the, the customer life. So she moved home with one of our co-owners. And now she's living a really happy retirement, like chasing <laughs> bugs in the backyard. It's Good much her. better her speed. <laughs> yeah. But she'll come to visit every now and then. And we get pictures um, from that bookseller. Um, but they're both wonderful. Um, awesome. And they're yeah, I would just really get in trouble with the booksellers if I, <laughs> if I had to pick. Totally fair. It was a controversial question. <laughs> <laughs> Which cat wrote the book? Dashiell. Nice. <laughs> yeah. That's um, the big one. That's the, the gregarious gray one, yeah. <laughs> needed a lot of body mass to fill that keyboard, you know. Um, <laughs> so we've talked a lot about the bookstore so far, and I want to know what is the best part about running a bookstore and what is the worst part about running a bookstore? I mean, it's just, it's so great to be like, I, this community work is really fulfilling and valuable to me. I've really gotten to know, um, a set of amazing coworkers very well. Um, you know, folks who have come and gone and folks who are still there. Um, it's been a real privilege to, to get to know them and work alongside them and just uh, to meet folks like you two and, and folks at publishers and just to get a sense of, uh, despite its challenges, how cool this industry can be and how many cool people are in it, um, trying to do good work despite everything that's stacked against us um, has been, that's like me finding my community is is meeting everybody, um, both at the Raven and nationwide and around the world. I've met some really great folks around the world from bookstores too. Um, so just the kind of people it brought me to, I think is the best part. Um, and like the hardest part is like, it's always challenging to turn a passion into a a business and it's like there are days where books are frustrating to me and it's like I love them I love reading them um but it's like it can be tricky um when when your bread and butter is is also like your passion and like that's kind of the dream but there's also a risk there are days when that's hard yeah um but I mean overall it's been the like the 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 best thing I've ever done. Like, so the, the good far outweighs the bad. I totally, I I love that idea of like it being really hard to turn your passion into like a business. Mm -hmm. I've dealt with that myself before. I was like really into music and I was like, I'm going to start a record label. Like a year in, I was like, I hate records now. (laughs) Like I never want to see another cassette or record for as long as I live. Yeah. I was I totally get it. I've been um, roller skating a lot. (laughs) um, Going to the rink. Um, and it's been really fun and I've gotten really interested in, in rink culture and the folks who do this and who have done it for decades. And it's like, of course me, I'm like, well, I should write a book about roller rinks. And then <laughs> like, after a while I was like, no, I don't think that I don't want to turn this into research. Like, this is fun. I want to keep this as not work. And so at least for now, I've decided against it just because of the perils of, of turning, um, something that you love and do for fun into, uh, uh a moneymaker. Danny, what is your favorite Waffle House menu item and why? <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> I'll tell you my my order. Um, well, it's I have a breakfast order and a lunch order. So <laughs> for, for breakfast, I get two eggs with bacon and hash browns, and I get nice. my hash browns smothered, chunked, and capped, which Excellent. means uh, onions, ham, and, and mushrooms. Um, and then the the Texas Bacon Chicken Club is a delicious chicken sandwich for lunch. It's very, very good. And I, like I asked them, like, like, why is this chicken so delicious? And one time they told me because they, it's like they ship it in the marinade. Like it's marinating <laughs> in uh, as they, they get the chicken. And so it's it's marinating for a long time. But <laughs> the secret is out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the first my first three poetry books each have a Waffle House poem in them. I really love um, it's, you know. One of those places I find joy in the the post capitalist 
hellscape we call the Midwest. <laughs> well, you know, speaking of what you just said about, you know, getting too close to things you love. And t- I worked at a Waffle House for one day. Did you really? For one will, day? <laughs> and I will tell you, I experience it differently now. I kind of okay. wish I could. I'm sure you do. I have all the admiration in the world for the folks who work there. That cannot be an easy job. There's no such thing as unskilled labor. And like, go to a Waffle House at 2 a.m. and you will understand that. It's a it's a tough crowd. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, um, all right. Last lightning round question. What is your current either desktop or phone background and why? Oh, that's the, the desktop is a, um, is it the, just the default? It's like some, <laughs> some blue blobs, but the, I've got the phone is the front plaza at Shakespeare and company, which oh, I nice. took when I was there. Um, it, it was, I was a writer in residence there for three days and it was really magical. They have an apartment that they, they loaned to writers um, upstairs in their building. Um, I went on their podcast, I signed some books and, and that was the price for like a place to stay in Paris for free for three days. It was a pretty good deal. Yeah. Um, so just to like, I mean, a lot of people go there and they breeze in and out in an hour and they're on to the next step, but to really sink into the history and to feel how much has happened in that place and how much those folks care about books um, was was really special. And I think the phone background kind of helps me connect to that. Like I can look at that and just think about the places this this job has taken me and people who have done a really good job stewarding a community for a really long time. And it's like, I put it there to kind of remind me even on the hard days that it's like, you know, you got to go to Shakespeare and Company and write about it. And these folks have figured out how to do really important stuff for a really long time. That's a really good answer. I'm glad it wasn't the default on both. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so our last thing before we say goodbye and ask you what you're reading. So there's your fair warning to be okay. side, side pulling up your story graph right now. Okay. Um, is Instagram story time where I think we told you we were kind of e-stalking your Instagram already. Okay. But we like to comb through it find a picture that we either find funny or interesting and ask for the story behind it. Okay. So Karen was the um, person that found this one. So yes, I was the, I was the stalker this week. Um, <laughs> and I went like pretty far back in the archives. Oh, for boy. This. So okay. here we go. Um, I found, I think a series of photos. You posted a few of these from a place called the Hamilton wood type and printing oh, museum. Yeah. Okay. And it looked like you were making some pretty sweet stuff there. What, mm. what's the scoop with this? I spent a week there. That was really cool. Um, I, um, when I was in my MFA at the University of Kansas, I was like looking to learn how to do other things because I had a feeling that teaching wasn't going to be it for me. One of those things was starting. To, I got a job at the Raven, which ended up being the answer to what I was going to do. Um, but I also took a book arts certificate and took a series of classes to learn how to design and make books. And so, like, I mean, that taught me how to use InDesign, which has been super helpful in my career. But one of the classes I got to take was a five day immersive class at, at Hamilton which is a, which is a, a it's an old um, print factory. No, they made wood type um, there. And now they have a big print shop. And we were there like from nine to five every day learning how to use their wood type and their letter presses. Um, it was super cool. Um, it was a while ago, it was maybe eight or nine years ago, but it was um, really fun just to like this beautiful antique wood type and it was like, we'll be here to help, but go experiment and have fun. And I like, it made me fall in love with Wisconsin. Like the, those the small towns in Wisconsin with the, the cheese curds and the brandy old fashions <laughs> and the, uh, yeah. Um, it's two rivers, Wisconsin. Hamilton is a great museum. It's open to the public. It's a really cool visit. And then that town is really fun too. It's just, it's, you know, a couple, it's an hour or two South of Door County. So it's definitely a good road trip stop. We've I actually went back after the, the a year or two later and went and hung out in the museum and helped them clean some type and and nice. have stayed in type. They're good folks. Oh, I'm like seething with envy. That program sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah. Linda Sampson Talur at, at the University of Kansas is an amazing um letterpress teacher and and a friend. And it's it just it was really cool to learn how to do that stuff. I took a letterpress class in college and then also I've taken classes after the fact just uh-huh. because I missed it. And when you just said cleaning the type, I got this like visceral <laughs> reaction to that smell. It's a very smell, particular right? smell. <laughs> and I just like, uh, took me back. Right. Um, <laughs> the toothbrush dipped in the, the yeah, mineral spirit. Exactly, yep. yeah. <laughs> Before we go, um, surprise, we want to know what you're reading right now and what you would recommend that we should go get. Okay, cool. Um, 
the uh right now i'm in a like a research mode i'm i'm working on a, i'm starting work on a poetry collection and i think it's going to be about um american jewish identity and and coming to terms with being a parent in a mixed marriage um so that's i'm reading a lot of like the classic uh jewish comedy novels um that's where i read the netanyahu's which was absolutely brilliant um i thought it was a, a like kind of a left field choice for the pulitzer i don't know why it took me so long to get to it but it's amazing and i'm now i'm reading everything is illuminated by jonathan safran foer which was a huge deal like 20 years ago um have never read it uh i'm enjoying it a lot in terms of um summer fiction um james mcbride has a new novel coming out um, next month, the Heaven and Earth grocery store, which actually fits into the Jewish comedy genre too. It's about a small town in Pennsylvania where the local black population and the local Jewish population kind of team up to um, to shelter uh, this um, the, the disabled kid from the state. Like he's a member of the black community, and the state wants to take him away. And it's a, it's a caper. If you know James McBride, you know it's told with great love for its characters and an amazing sense of humor. He's probably my favorite novelist. And like, this is, he's only written a couple, um, but The Good Lord Bird and Deacon King Kong are both incredible. And this is a really great addition to the James McBride. Um, You're going to love our next episode of this podcast then, because that's who we're interviewing. So Karen are you and really? I are, Yeah. So Karen and I are both actively reading that book right now. Oh like, my I haven't Karen. started it yet. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm actively reading it. <laughs> Tell him that Danny from The Raven is a huge fan. Um, we will. I met him at Winter Institute once, but I love those books. He's so yeah. great. And he's a really interesting person to talk to. You guys are going to have a great time. Yeah, we can't oh, wait. awesome. That's a good get. Nice job, guys. Yeah. It's always, <laughs> it's always an honor to like, I was on the Shakespeare and Company podcast and like Hernan Diaz was just on it the other day. And yeah. like they've interviewed Otessa Moshfeg. It's always a like a kind of an eye-opening moment for me to see who else has been on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you are an equally big deal, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Well, Danny, thank you so much for spending your Friday afternoon with us. This was such a pleasure. And um, we can't wait to keep in touch. And uh, we'll talk to you about that that next audio book. Let's get okay, it going. Please do. I'm totally interested. All right. And say hi to James for me. <laughs> we will. We will. Thanks for the time. Cool. Nice to see you again. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Well, I think that about does it for our interview. Thank you so much for listening. As of the date that this podcast airs, September 19th, you can get your hands on a copy of Danny's book, How to Protect Independent Bookstores and Why. So highly recommend that you go check that out. You can also get the audiobook version from us at Libro FM. Yes, please run to your nearest bookstore and purchase this book. Danny is a gem and deserves your money. Give him and your local bookstore your money. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Protect that bookstore. Well, Craig, before we go, I would love to hear a little bit about what you are currently reading. I just started a new book, um, so I don't have a strong opinion on it yet. But for any listener of this podcast or friend of mine in real life, you might know that I like a author you may have heard of named Stephen King. <gasps> I didn't know this about you. I'm stunned. <laughs> wow. I can tell from your face. You are so <laughs> stunned. Um, yes, Stephen King just released a new book called Holly. And for readers of Stephen King, the name will sound familiar. Um, it is Holly Gibney, who has made appearances in other Stephen King books. Um, most recently, The Outsider, which I absolutely adored. Um, the Outsider was so good. Um, so I am very excited to dive into Holly and see what she is up to. Um, I'm just a little bit into it. And it is told from different perspectives, which I love. Um, it is kind of a whodunit thriller, horror. Wow, big surprise being Stephen King. Um, but I'm liking it so far. I'm interested to see where it goes. Um, I will not say too much more about it. I do not want to have an opinion that I will have to walk back in a future episode. So <laughs> um, for now, I will say that if you liked The Outsider, Go grab this book. I've been hearing so much about this. My dad and my sister are huge Stephen King fans. Like they've read everything and they're sharing a copy of this. And there's been a lot of family conversations like, hurry up, hurry up, finish it so I can read it. When you first said it, I was like, did they cut it in half? Like, 
<laughs> horizontally. Is that how that works? <laughs> oh, that's even worse. I, I, I was picturing directly down the center. More, it's more work that way. Um, cool. Good to know. Thank you for the recommendation. <laughs> um, speaking of recommendations, what are you reading, Karen? Also reading horror. <gasps> Shocked. And loving it. I am reading The September House by Carissa Orlando. And it is so enjoyable. This book is about an older couple who has moved into... It's it's a classic haunted house story. They've moved into this house that's like been on and off the market over and over again. It's super old. People keep selling it back to the bank for unknown reasons. Um, the realtor, when they buy this, is super cagey with them about like, oh, like maybe let's skip the basement on this tour, that <laughs> kind of thing. And sure enough, they move in. There are ghostly apparitions all over this house who over the course of time, they've come to know their names. Some of them are like your classic, like creepy children. I can't believe I like this book. <laughs> this sounds so, amazing. I'm so scared of ghosts and I love this book. Um, there is something particularly nefarious happening in the basement of this house um, that's kind of orchestrating all of the shenanigans. And the reason we call it the September house is that in September, blood starts pouring from the walls. and Oh, no. The, the ghostly figures become extra heightened in their shenanigans that they're perpetrating against the owners. And um, basically, we pick up the story. This has been going on for multiple years. Um, the husband has either left or gone missing. We're not sure. Um, the woman's daughter comes back to visit to try to help figure out where the husband has gone. And Margaret, the main character, is desperately trying to hide the goings on in this house from her daughter because she thinks the daughter is going to try to make her move out. Um, and she refuses to leave this house. She loves this house. So um, I am 60% of the way through. I love it. It's honestly like the writing is very funny at times. Um, the narrator is just amazing. Uh, I, I can't wait to finish this. Hopefully tonight. I'm going to buy this book. <laughs> It's really just, good. <laughs> while you were talking, I Googled. I was like, when did this come out? One, if it didn't come out in September, I'm pissed. And two, <laughs> yeah. is it out now? Or do you have some sort of special, I'm a fancy podcaster, privileges? But no, it came out September 5th. So yeah, as I say on most episodes, I will be heading down to the Brookline Booksmith directly after this recording and buying this book. I think you'll love it. This is right up your alley. And um, You had me at Haunted Health Shenanigans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I do recommend listening to the audiobook as well. I'm doing the classic back and forth between mm -hmm. the two. And the narrator for the audiobook is Chef's Kiss. She's crushing it. I love her. Nice. Love a back and forth. Indeed. Um, I will pick this up. I will report back to you. It better Please be do. good. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm confident you're going to like it. Well, everyone, thank you for listening to another episode of our podcast. If you follow it thank you please give us a rating if you do not think about it it's fun <laughs> give it a follow just saying it might be fun also if you are not a libro fm member yet you can sign up using the special code libro podcast and you will get two audiobook credits for your first month of membership instead of just one and as always thank you for listening 